I'm Nigel Douglas. Uh, I work on with the Open Source Falco team, um, specifically around kind of this messaging and marketing around what our solutions can do. Um, so fundamentally, Falco is a IDS style tool. It's uh, like if you think intrusion detection, you think you know camera looking at what's going on in your environment. That you're pretty right in saying that's what Falco is doing. So a lot of organizations are focused purely on the shift left methodology, which is great. It's it's your right to talk about things like infrastructure as code, um, defining what are, you know, risky or unacceptable images to be introducing into your runtime. Because for those who are joining today's session or we're talking cloud native, we're really talking about containers uh, or containerized workloads. So if you think like orchestration platforms like Kubernetes, um, then we're we're really talking about you know this kind of containerized workload uh, environment. So how those containers end up running in your environment, usually you don't just create them on the fly. They're usually part of a, an idea of like bring them from infrastructure as code templates, and then they eventually run run into appear in runtime. Um, so yeah, you know shift left is all about scanning um, security um, of those templates. Um, the build process, again, identifying what are unacceptable images um, in your CI/CD pipeline. Where Falco comes in helpful is we're focused on the shield right approach. So what that means is things like, you know, once you've actually deployed those images and they're running, uh, once they become containers, um, what are they doing? And how, what happens if, say, for instance, there's a running container and it's got elevated permissions and it gets compromised? That's the kind of scenario we're looking at here at Falco. So things like, you know, was a container from the shift left approach created with um, uh, a higher permissions? So it was given, you know, privilege set to true. So it, you know, has kind of the host permissions or privileges. So it can run as root, essentially. Um, you might use things like open policy agents, you know, to define what are things you do or don't allow in runtime. Um, and those are all from kind of configuration standpoint. But if certain configurations are bypassed, if uh, things are turned off, if logging is disabled, how do you know that's happening? Uh, Falco's, again, the solution for that. So we're going to talk about kind of threat detection, instant response, forensics, using Falco in today's session. So it's very much an introductory point. But again, it's not shift right instead of shift left. It's to complement the whole process of you scan security from your pipeline, but once the images, once they become containers running in your, you know, in runtime, then you also want to be able to detect and understand what's going on and, and, and then mitigate as well um, those bad practices. So recently, one thing again, for those who are coming from, let's say a traditional security standpoint, you're not huge into how different things work within the cloud native or Kubernetes environment. Um, the OWASP team, you know, they make all these kind of standardized frameworks for how we should and shouldn't um, enforce certain security best practices. Um, the OWASP team put together a really nice framework for Kubernetes. It's the OWASP top 10, the top 10 things you should be doing in regards to securing your Kubernetes environment. Um, one thing I've done with the help of my colleagues is putting together a uh, it's a blog, but it kind of came out more like a thesis. <laughs> so it's looking at those 10 uh, categories, everything from insecure workload configurations through to vulnerable uh, Kubernetes components, and then giving recommendations or you know best practices as how you would actually implement those features. So um, OWASP went to the effort of defining what you should do, and then we wrote the blog and really defined how you would do that in reality. Um, again, the link is at the bottom here. So even if you just looked up OWASP top 10 in Google search, I think it ranked pretty well. So that's something anyone can look up if it's something you find interesting. Um, so yeah, containers, for those who aren't really familiar with the whole concept of containers and cloud native, what they are not is essentially process of running on the same host with the same kernel. You know, there's different ways that they can all be implemented. Uh, some containers can be created, you know, like I say there, with elevated permissions. Some can be set with limited permissions. There can be different um, network restrictions on each container and different network namespaces. How they work in your environment is radically different to, you know, one another. Um, yeah, they all follow general cross, uh, practical, I guess, assumptions. Like, they are for all, they're all ephemeral by design. So, like, you know, they can be killed and recreated. That's one thing that we would apply in the in the Kubernetes environment. But generally speaking, like containers work in a bunch of different ways. Some are long lived, some are not. Um, and we'll take those kind of considerations, let's say, 
um, when we're looking at how we're going to put these different security guardrails. Like if they run in different network namespaces, do we have an open policy agent policy rule around it define what we do and don't permit in that network namespace? Do we have, for instance, network policies to restrict traffic in those network namespaces? We'll talk about all that as well, as well as C groups as well in this session. Um, so yeah, unique problems. One thing Sysdig does as a as a company, other than you know maintaining open source projects like Sysdig Inspect and Falco, which we'll talk about in a while, is we try to analyze real world data. And the reason behind it is really to justify the argument for why you need to focus on these best practices. So the first part I talked about a second ago is that containers are ephemeral by nature. Uh, nature. What that means is essentially unlike let's say a traditional VM that holds a monolith application, you can have a VM holding containers, the containers are expected to die. It's just the whole idea of them being highly scalable or highly available is that depending on if you need more containers or less based on demand for your public facing application, this microservice architecture, um, containers can be deleted and recreated at, at will. Um, so again, 72% or so live less than five minutes. So don't think that you know, you're going to do a vast amount of troubleshooting inside a container because it's not going to last very long. And what that means is because a container is ephemeral, you know, we're not looking at a fixed IP assigned to a container, you know, the way we would talk about with monolith applications. Instead, you're going to have like container IDs with IPs, but those IPs, you know, are going to change every time the container ID changes, and that changes every time the container is recreated. So yeah, again, it takes a whole new approach to securing those containers. Um, the other part is that, yeah, companies have trouble keeping pace with the vulnerability landscape. When Once you start taking images from public repositories, you know, like Docker Hub, um, what you're going to notice is that, you know, there's just so many images being created. Um, there's all sorts of documentation, articles that people are writing about how to do certain configurations or tests. And yeah, they're creating all these new images and plopping them into these templates or definition files. And the reality is 87% of those images are likely vulnerable. You know, it's not uncommon to think that when you see Docker Hub, you might think they're all legitimate images, quite the opposite. Actually, most can be uploaded by anyone and there's no way of, you know, doing the test on it initially to see if it's bad or not. Obviously, that's the whole point of the shift left and runtime scanning is to check for these vulnerabilities um, that exist within those images. But don't think that just because there's a legitimate repo that all the images are clean within it. The other side of it is, you know, you use different applications yourself. You know, like let's say you use different components within your Kubernetes environment. I have um, a CNI, you know, a, a container networking interface. It could be provided by, you know, AWS. They have their own CNI, or it could be Calico or Cilium. And those plugins themselves, they could have, you know, malicious, Im not malicious images, but they could be carrying their own vulnerabilities. So we have to look at the supply chain perspective is that, you know, the more complex your cloud native environment comes, the more third party tools you're using and testing, those themselves could be vulnerable. Uh, and again, how do you detect what is or is not normal behavior from these applications you're using? So that's what we talk about when we're talking about the supply chain is, you know, legitimate applications that could actually become the point of failure in your environment. And then again, the path of least resistance is a sad thing is that like, People are still creating images for whatever reason, testing or whatever, and they're still being created with root permissions. I'll show you two examples later for why they right to create the image without these elevated permissions, but what damage could be done if a container is created with root permissions. And again, we'll show that in a live demo. Um, so yeah, once there was a perimeter, you know, so um, you know, in the in traditional environments we talked about, like again, it was pretty standardized in regards to how you secure environment. You create a, a perimeter-based firewall and you decide what traffic you do and don't permit into and out of the environment. Um, cloud native becomes complicated in the sense that you're trying to make your application public facing. You want different, again, we talked about ephemeral applications to speak with the public facing internet, but you don't obviously don't want to allow all traffic. So how do we do these kind of restrictions? You know, well, first of all, we want to secure what's going on within the cluster communications, but also what goes on outside. Um, we use different concepts for firewalling. We would use, for instance, um, well, it depends on how you're approaching it, but like there's, um, you can use things like Istio or Linkerd service meshes to control L7 traffic. There's um, network plugins or there's network policy implementations that can do the L3, L4 traffic. 
But either way, you know, what you're permitting out of the environment, what you're permitting in, um, how do we know, for instance, what is a um, like what is a potential denial of service attack on your container environment? How are you monitoring it? By default, there is no monitoring, for instance, and there, there's a flat network design. So all workloads are freely communicating with each other. So by default, Kubernetes or cloud native is relatively insecure by the design of what it is, which is something that's supposed to be highly scalable, highly dynamic. So you've got to start putting in these guardrails. And the problem is when you're testing all these new applications, new tools, new frameworks that you're not familiar with, you're hardly going to start implementing strict rules to say only permit these ports and protocols because I don't know what it needs to speak out to, for instance, in regards to a, a content delivery network, for instance. So, you know, that's where, you know, tools like Falco become really helpful for educating users in that journey. So, for instance, if a container is making communication with an unusual um, IP address that's listed in a known bad IP list, and again, it's specifically, you know, if we talk about the firewall, what it would tell us is the node is making these outbound connections, but it wouldn't give us any more granularity. Since Falco is focusing on all the system calls that go on within the host or container, we can specifically say this container ID 10 minutes ago before it was killed and recreated and got a new ID, we can say it actually made that outbound connection. So again, we'll go through that in a second in, in a while, but it's important to know that like there's all these new concepts, new logic that we need to think about rather than traditional security mindset like firewalls and that kind of approach. Um, so yeah, like I actually kind of covered a lot of this. So you know, your cloud native environment, what I talk about those containers and Kubernetes, yeah, it could be running in a cloud environment. So again, it has its own logic. You know, you have uh, um, your security groups, for instance, to decide what is and what is or is not permitted uh, within the environment. Um, the cloud is generally exposed to the outside world. So you got to say, OK, I'm opening up all this activity, but what happens if someone probes it? Um, so you want to have like, yeah, deep visibility for both the containers, the host, you'd want it for Kubernetes, which has its own abstractions, things like deployment services that are different to the container itself. Um, but then you also want to see what's going on in the cloud environment. Um, Falco is a really good tool for this. So what we, by default, like we mentioned, system calls, so anything that goes on in Linux, basically, um, we can see that by default, which is great. You don't need to configure anything to happen. So containers, Kubernetes, or well, containers and the host, you know, we're pretty good on that deep visibility, but then we have a plugin architecture. So things like if you want Kubernetes visibility into those abstractions we talked about when a deployment is created, created or deleted, whatever the reasoning is, a config map was created or sensitive credentials were accessed within those, um, within those unique um, constructs of Kubernetes, then yeah, we will actually trigger alerts, detections on that. And then we can create again by the same pluggable architecture, we could create a, a plugin for AWS or, or you know Azure Cloud, so that we can also see what is the unusual behavior in the cloud environment. So when we talk about cloud native, it is everything from containers, the host, Kubernetes, cloud, and you want to have that deep visibility, even through to your IAM provider, something like Okta. You know we can create rules around that because we have a plugin in that case. So how all the different components communicate with each other. So we need to be able to detect unusual activity, and again, that involves how different components interact with one another. So yeah, what I try to say is think of Falco as that security camera, you know, that just sees everything that's going in your environment. By default, it's not gonna actually detect, or it's not gonna respond, it's not gonna take action on something. It's purely focused on identifying intrusion or identifying unusual behavior, indicators to compromise within your environment. You can, of course, use Falco to send an alert, send a HTTP a webhook, whatever it is into your automation pipeline or structure, but don't focus on Falco as that tool that you just say, if I see something, kill it. Because that's just not the intention of the tool. The idea is that we're, we have this deep forensics tool here to see what are the essentially hard to monitor um, activities, at least with all the relevant constructs to see this container ID at this timestamp associated with this, node you know you want to have all of those relevant constructs inside your alert that's where falco is powerful so yeah you know for those who are wondering why i mentioned falco all the time here um the company i work for sysdig yes it's the parent company behind falco when we talk about the cloud native compute foundation they're actually um 
handling the incubation project, uh, incubation process associated with Falco. So it is an incubation project. What that means is essentially the Cloud Native Compute Foundation, the CNCF, um, they, you know, have a say in kind of how Falco um, should work, how it should work with the community. And then there is a graduation process for the project too. Um, so it is a CNCF project. It's recognized. It's actually the de facto, what I mean by the, the standardized approach for IDS actually within CNCF environments, so cloud native environments. Um, so it's really great to know um, we are the company that are maintaining it. However, there is a, an open source community that contribute to project. And we strongly recommend, recommend if someone is interested on this call in contributing to a project like this to, to absolutely get in contact with us. It's, it's a really exciting project to be working on. Um, so to give context, again, for those who missed out on anything or didn't cover it, you know, it's a runtime detection engine. So it looks at what's going on at runtime. Um, you know, that means observability. So seeing what goes on the nodes, the cloud environment, the, the containers. We talked about that a while ago. Yes, integration to Kubernetes, um, having a dedicated Kubernetes plugin and then correlating, um, say an alert, say I have this Kubernetes context and this container ID context into a relevant alert, something that other traditional security tools would strongly fail at. You know, they might say this process happened on this node, but we don't know how that ties into the, you know, realm of Kubernetes or cloud native. Like, how can I take action on that if I just know there was a process ID at a certain at, at, at time? And because it's ephemeral, you know, that's no use to me right now because that's an old workload that's no longer in existence. Uh, it's also built on eBBF. So for those who are familiar with this concept of eBBF, it's just a really powerful framework that you can actually start writing arbitrary hooks into the Linux kernel. Um, again, for observability security, it's it's a more stable, faster approach to doing security. And Falco, um, there's other tools, by the way, that are implementing EVVF today. You can see things like the Cilium project, um, actually Isovalent also managed another project called Tetragon. Um, that's another security IDPS tool. Um, that is again using EBBF. And then there's observability tools like um, I'm trying to think now. There's um oh Pixie Labs, I think. Yeah, they they also um implement EBBF. So there's a bunch of tools using this technology. It's really just cutting edge. And again, Falco is always about being part of that cutting edge um development. To when we talk about cutting edge and like where it's come from, Falco, you know, you can rest assured there's in the confidence of the project in the sense that. Our CTO um, and original maintainer of the project, um, Loris Dejuani, he um, he's uh, he contributed. I mean, he's one of the co-authors of Wireshark. So, for anyone from the traditional idea or so security uh, networking environment, um, yeah, you probably all use Wireshark. You use it for packet captures to see what's going on. Uh, again, anomalous, unusual behavior, process level inside your environment. Then. He built out a project called Sysdig Inspect or Sysdig, which is an open source tool, again, that's focused on packet captures, but more for the containers and Kubernetes environment. So again, where Wireshark couldn't do those environments, Sysdig came along to essentially uh, solve that problem. And then the evolution moved in towards Falco. I mean, Sysdig Inspect is still a tool. It's separate to Falco, but Falco is that you know, extra gap that we're solving, which is the intrusion detection for the cloud native environments. So you can see there's a bunch of companies that actively maintain or not maintain, contribute or use. So, you know, you'd have like, for instance, um, Apple or one of the largest contributors to the project, um, whether that be in the form of contributing to the actual tool itself or to the policies, you know, or I should say rules when we're talking about Falco. So these are the rules or the, the logic that's you say, how I'm going to detect this bad behavior, or anomalous behavior. Um, and again, it, it makes sense why these large software vendors are contributing or using it because it solves a new problem that can't be solved by traditional security methods. Um, so with that, yeah, to give you an idea, an architectural view of what Falco does, um, like I mentioned, by default, we're handling those system call events or syscalls. Um, we also handle Kubernetes audit logs um, there is a dedicated plugin for that. But when we say under other sources, basically, if you want to take in, you know, um, event data, stream events from something else, and it could be anything to an IoT device, like your doorbell, <laughs> you know, as long as you can connect to that API, you can retrieve those events um, as a in the form of a plugin. So you see under our Falco plugin, you, there are 
already a bunch of Falco plugins that we've created, but you can create your own because it's open source. There's no restriction on that. So as long as you can handle the, uh, the, the events that are coming from that tool, then create the plugin for it. And then for that, the same unique rules engine in the same YAML manifest format, all of the same conditions that you use for the system call events, you can apply to those other plugins, which means you've got a scalable solution that if you were creating a plugin for a new cloud provider that didn't exist yesterday or ChatGPT or whatever it is that you want to handle events from, then yeah, in, in theory, you know, you can then start creating security rules. Now, ChatGPT would be a pretty um, useless example, but you get the idea of if it was a cloud provider, as an example, or an IAM solution, not an IAM, but your identity provider. So, you know, if you have a tool that you use for accessing tools um, or logging in, then yeah, you want to try to create a rule for suspicious login attempts. That would be a very useful case for Falco. And then from an output perspective, yeah, you can ship off events to a HTTP endpoint, like we mentioned for notifications. You could write it to a file output, um, like, and then apply that file change. And again, it's part of an automation effort. You can run a shell activity based on it. So, you know, remote shell based on rule was triggered, stuff like that. And then what I'm going to do just to make it more visually appealing for the session, you can also ship events to a tool we created ourselves called Falco Sidekick. So it's essentially does two things. Sidekick's a, a event handler, so it can do some of these automation efforts, but also it's a UI for exposing, you know, what are the rule, uh, rules that were triggered. So with that, yeah, I'm going to try to talk about, you know, recently we had this um, security breach that we identified our threat research team called Scarlet Eel. And why it's so interesting is that the attacker actually got initial access to um, um, a Kubernetes environment. Um, now, what they did is they ran crypto mining, but it wasn't for the purpose of actually doing crypto mining. If anything, it was purely for, you know, uh, throwing people off the scent of what they were actually doing. So they were doing a bunch of enumeration on AWS resources. They were trying to see what, you know, they could find. They were trying to steal credentials to move laterally. And when they did move laterally from one AWS account to another, what they started doing was, you know, again, continuing the process of finding um, credentials from Terraform scripts or Lambda scripting. Um, they started disable logging. They were doing so many individual activities that you can see that this attack that started public facing went everywhere from containers and Kubernetes in the form of the crypto mining and trying to steal, resort, uh, steal credentials to moving not just into one cloud environment associated with Kubernetes, but moving laterally from one AWS account to another. And that absolutely justifies the use case here for having a tool that gives you the same context and the same unique policy language framework to actually monitor and observe these behaviors. So you can actually draw a picture a bit like this to say, okay, something happened 20 minutes ago and I'm seeing events triggered from all these other tools that were collecting log events from via Falco. I'm starting to paint a picture in my head that this is where the attack is played out. So you know, I don't want to spend too long on the slides. I do want to show you the tool in action. So one of the things I'm just going to cover here quickly is the rule logic. So, you know, here's a Falco rule. You can see that the top is the triggered event, which comes out of it. So it says at this timestamp, uh, it said warning symlinks created over sensitive files. And it gives you the additional context, like this user at this time, you can put in those, um, those, um, targets, I guess, what you want to put in of what's going to throw up inside your alert. But the rule at the bottom is what you say, like, what is the name of my rule? What's the description of my rule? The condition is the important thing. So, you know, output is what you get in the alert, but the condition is what it's actually going to trigger on. So you can create things like macros and macros can involve lists. So a macro could be like these actions and then a list could be these files, let's say, for instance, or MD5 hashes or IP, IP list. And in this case, you can see an event argument target, which is just anything from, you know, from the system call logic, we're saying it's an event, it's an argument, it's targeted in, and then you can see sensitive file names is just a list of sensitive file names, or it's the event target is set in these sensitive directory names. So notice how you can use and or Boolean logic to define a rule. And again, it's really simple logic to apply. And we'll show more complex examples in a while. Tagging is really then when you want to get your alert, you also want to have 
as part of your pipeline, getting additional context, things like, okay, where what was the environment that was affected? Or you could tie in things like MITRE attack framework to say it was an exfiltration attempt or as credential access. And what was the TID associated with that? So when we're talking about tactics and uh, techniques in MITRE attack, might as well put those into the tagging. Or you could say it was an AWS environment or it was on-prem, whatever. It's totally arbitrary what you put in tags, but it gives you that additional context. So with that, yeah, we said there like create symlink, you can see in the create symlink, it's a macro. And in that macro, it is listed what are the um, things that we want to list. So you can see symlink or sensitive file, I should say, sensitive file names it, and the sensitive directory name are both lists. And in those lists, you can list what are the things. So again, they can be, in this case, file names, they could be IPs, MD5s, whatever it is. We'll talk about that more in a second. But this is the art logic that in a rule, you can have macros and the macro you can have list to show it on screen makes it look com complicated, but it's rather straightforward. Um, so yeah, here are just common examples of things that you can alert on. So things like um, running shell and environment, um, maybe someone's changing a network name in space, whatever it is, there's a bunch of default rules that already exist. Like I say, that helps you with your education on whether or not your environment is actually insecure. And then you can define what is the priority of the alert to say if it's critical, low severity, medium severity, whatever to define, is this something like, so if it's someone's executing a crypto miner, that's critical, you know, like this under no circumstances, a good thing for your work environment. Um, and yeah, like we can categorize our rules then into different things like, is it a best practice? Is it regulatory compliance, vulnerability, cloud native stack, whatever it is. I'm not going to spend too long talking about this because it's relatively straightforward. So yeah, let's go into the demo. So I'm going to show Falco in action. Um, and again, anyone let me know if they're having issues reading or seeing anything that's on screen and I can try and make things a little bit bigger. Um, cool. So I'll make that a little bit smaller and I'll move that up here. So with that, um, yeah, we'll go to the example I was talking about there a second ago. So we mentioned that you can create um, uh, an overly permissive environment, or you could create, a, let's say, an environment that's less permissive. So let's say I'm going to make a curl command, and I've just got these publicly documented manifests. So in the security context two, if I say cat security context two, you can see, and again, I'll make that a bit bigger so everyone can see. Um, I'll just move that down a bit here. And yeah, that's perfect. So with that example, you can see with the allow privilege escalation was set to false. So we're not trying to create a privileged pod. We're trying to create a, a, a pod that, yeah, will do certain things. Like we want it, for instance, to pull an image from Google Cloud Registry, it's some generic node hello we talked about. If sensitive images are being used, we want to detect on that. This is a fine use case. You know, we gave it specific permissions. We set what it's going to do. And this is a definition for a pod. So if I say kubectl apply dash f on the security context demo, what it does is it'll tell me in Kubernetes, you've now created that pod. And if I was to go and say kubectl exec or shell into that pod I just created, you can then start doing stuff in that container. So just like a node that you SSH into, uh, let me check there. Um, I would say kubectl get pods, probably just taking a second to create. Uh, okay, it's running now. So in that case, if I shell into the pod I just created, I can start doing things. You see, I get the little dollar symbol that tells me you've successfully shelled into that workload. Now you can start performing actions. You can say things like PS augs, whatever and you can start seeing what's going on in the environment. What I'm gonna show is up here, we have the Falco sidekick. So I was talking about that exposed UI, I'm just port forwarding it to my local host. So you can see here, like the first thing it's telling me is like there was a terminal shown to a container. We know it was in the default network namespace. So that's when I just said kubectl without specifying namespace. So we know that it was created in default. The pod name, see we talked about security context demo two, that was the name of the pod I just created. So as you start doing things, first of all, Falco's in real time. So, you know, there's no scheduled intervals where we start getting security events. That would be kind of useless from a, you know, an incident response and forensics perspective. So as I start to do security actions, notice how the alert starts showing up in the UI in real time. So yeah, if I want to curl and download a package that wasn't part of that shield left methodology, what I should or permit on the environment. Notice how it'll say 
failed writing body. So yeah, I tried curling. I tried bullying down a package. Permission denied. I'm not allowed to do that. So already as a, <clears throat> as a hacker, life's been made a little bit troublesome for me because I've downloaded the packet. I've created the pod. <clears throat> I've gone into it or assumed, let's say, exec into an already running workload. And it, you know, I can't do much. I'm limited to what I can do. But if I was to exit and I would want to download a more permissive pod, so I can even just delete this definition file. And you know, when you delete something, that's data destruction, you know, so something's getting deleted in your environment. So if I go here and control C, yeah. So here, when we refresh, we should, we should, maybe it's a second to show up. I'll come back to that in one moment. But let's say if I try to create the overly permissive pod, I think I should already have it. So let's say cat privilege. Notice how this time I'm creating something very similar. There's not a lot to be said for it. You know, the image is sent to S. I gave it some arbitrary command stuff that's going to apply in the environment, but notice how the privilege is set to true. So that's where you're giving it full root permissions for that container. So if I was to say kubectl apply dash e, and notice how this time I created into a namespace called overly permissive, that's the only difference. So when I say, yeah, create the pod privileged pod, this time it will tell me it's created. But when I say kubectl get pods, Rather, this time you won't see any pod. And the reason why is because it was created into namespace overly permissive. So overly permissive. So yeah, you know, Kubernetes has all these, its own uh, constructs like namespaces that you need to be aware of. So when we trigger the alert, notice how it tells us <clears throat> it launched a privileged container as opposed to, you know, just shell into a container. It launched a privileged container, which is Okay, it's informational because people actually generally do this all the time. But as we mentioned, like 92% of containers were run as root. It's probably not a good thing you should be doing, generally speaking. So this way it would tell us the pod name was sent to a server. It was, sorry, I'm going to go back to that. Um, I'm going to remove that filter. Sorry, I shouldn't. Have, yeah. So with that, you can see it was the sent to a server. We give like, for instance, what was the process command line? What was actually in that? Remember we talked about there, like, sleep, see, shell, all of that context comes through in the alert. And I also see things, for instance, like to what network namespace was it created? And what was the user? It was running as root. So this time, now that we know it's running as root, if I want to shell into that overly permissive pod, I can do that with the same command. And I obviously have specified the namespace, overly permissive, and I'm in. But this time I'm in as root at CentOS server, which was the name of the pod. Um, so this time I terminal shell into a container, we get the alert telling us in real time. And notice how on the left side, we get the relevant tags that tell us MITRE execution. You know, you're executing an action. Other than that, there's nothing really to say. It's happening on a container as opposed to a host. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do is try to download the same package. This time, um, it'll work. So last time it failed because of permissions. This time, there's nothing to stop me as a root user downloading the package. Um, unzipping the tarball, you see now I have, if I do ls, I now have a new directory called xmrig, so I can do cd xmrig, and I'm in there, and inside that folder I have the files we just mentioned there, like config.json, xmrig, and the SHA file. Um, now, unzoding the package, you know, certain things are going to happen, like I get an error telling me, okay, they're writing below root, like is there any justifiable reason for doing this? It tells us it was the xmrig binary, for those who don't know xmrig, it's, it's a very popular mining binary uh, for doing crypto mining. So with that, you know, I want to, yeah, make this an executable. So I can, you know, run chmod, change that uh, permissions on the file. And with that, I want to execute it. So I can do a few things here. If I run this command and remove the background flag, because I don't want to run it silently, you can see I'm running the crypto mining task. A few things will happen. First of all, I'm getting a flood of alerts for cryptocurrency flag specified. The reason is I actually created this rule myself. It's not part of the default rule set. However, it's actually looking for every time there's one of these, um, see the way there's milliseconds for these uh, threads? It's basically triggering on every thread. So this is badly written. So what I might do is omit the warnings and instead look for all the things that are like critical and sure enough under outside of all the noise i just created there 
there's one really important rule, and this was here by default, which is to detect outbound connections to a common miner pool. And sure enough, you see it's on the CentOS pod. You know, it was this command that was run, the command I literally just ran there, which is eggs and rig, donate to what, you know, you even see to which pool it's communicating with, what wallet ID was used. All that context is there. So we know crypto mining was performed. Um, if I was to kill that example, like why it triggered all those alerts was basically I wanted to say, if I see certain flags being used, like <clears throat> in this case, coin Monero. So if coin Monero is being used or a coin, um, I don't know, ETH, you know, the Ethereum one, <clears throat> it'll trigger an alert on it. So one of the other default rules, so if I go back here and we say like, we actually have a nice tool that my colleague put together and you can go to it today, it's publicly facing, you don't need any login credentials. Um, you can look up these mining scenarios. So things like Stratum protocol, you can see that it's enabled by default. So there's a rule here called detect crypto miners using Stratum. So it's telling me it's critical priority. Um, and it's basically saying, if I see the Stratum flag being used, which is Stratum 2 point plus SSL or Stratum the first version plus SSL, then it will trigger um, an alert on it. So what I want to do is I want to run a similar command to what I did earlier, but this time, instead of using the flag, you know, the, the Monero flag that triggered all those false detections, they're not false, it's just too many. It's, it's useless in a real world scenario. So in this case, you can see I'm, I'm using the Stratum protocol flag um, for my crypto mining, but I'm sending it to a user lies at lies dot lies. It's not a real user, by the way. So if I hit enter, notice how it'll tell me like probably, you know, yeah, no, actually the location's fine. So what's happened is I'm triggering an action here with this Stratum protocol. If I go back to my UI, you can see if I remove maybe critical and unselect all, you can see here, let's, oh yeah, here we go. So I got a real-time alert telling me, yes, it's detecting outbound connection to a mining pool, this time via, you know, the, the new XMRI command, but it's also um, connected via Stratum. So what you can say is, like, rather than looking for certain flags, let's say, instead look for, you know, a protocol that's only associated with crypto mining. That's, you know, definitely wouldn't be used under any other circumstance. Um, then we should trigger detection on that. But in regards to the bit a second ago we were talking about, which was the um, the IPs that we're communicating with, or um, the mining pools, I should say, in ports, uh, to show you how that works, if we go into, again, our because it's an open source project, you can go and find these rules yourself in GitHub. So if we looked up a uh, pool, let's say, um, you can see here. So I have a, let's say, mining pool. Uh, yeah, so you know we had earlier a rule that said detect crypto mining to stratum protocol. We also have a rule that's detect open connections to minor pools and ports. I can make this a bit bigger if anyone's having an issue reading it. But essentially, what you're going to do is tra track a certain uh, list of activities. So the first one is we say the condition is looking for anything in net miner pool. Now, we don't know if that's a list or a macro. So I do control C, control F, control V. You can see net miner pool is used as a macro. And the macro is saying, if we see send to, send message, connect, any of these against, you know, what is in the minor pool. So we can see here um, the minor pool HTTP, the minor pool other. This is where we're starting to get our answers. So we can create lists for things like uh, HTTP addresses. We could do other. So if we do that, you can see minor pool other is another macro. And in that macro, you can specify the minor ports and minor domains. So if I want to see what are the domains, you can say, again, control F, and you can say, here are the domains. So you can see here, these are all the mining pools, the common pools. Now keep in mind, crypto mining isn't so complicated to monitor in hindsight, because there's pretty standard DNS or IP addresses that are used. And similarly, they only use a fixed list of ports or a finite list of ports that are associated with those. So what we're doing is you create a rule, say, if I see a port being used and it's also matching one of these domains, which is associated mining pool, then I will trigger the alert here for the mining pool example we talked about there. So if I look up uh, pool, you can see the rule is here to detect outbound connection to mining pool and port and all that additional context here. So rather than you needing to skim through GitHub the way I just did there, you know, we have a nice public facing 
GUI for actually seeing what rules exist by default and really going further into the weeds of the tool. But as I say, because it's intrusion detection, you don't want to just have one fixed use case and talk about crypto mining. You also want to be able to, for instance, um, detect when there's unusual um, network activity, network tools being used, let's say, or installs happening. So like I have this story around launching a suspicious networking tool in your environment. Um, one of the things is when we went into that in, uh, overly permissive environment that we're in right now, um, and I try to install, for instance, Telnet via the YUM repository, what we'll notice, and I go back here to um, where we were doing crypto mining, and I hit enter, you can see here that it will fail. It's an issue with like AppStream. Again, you don't want to um, give them root permissions because this isn't something you're really supposed to be modifying, at least in a running container. It doesn't make much sense. So as you know, given full permissions, what I can do is I can like CD to this yum directory, you know, where you can make changes to mirror list. And I can actually just start swapping in what I want to do. So I can swap in, you can see here, the relevant mirror list for um, CentOS. Um, I can make the changes here. Notice how when I start making changes, these are funny because it'll start triggering alerts on like updating your package repo. Like, why are you updating the package repository associated with the container? Like, if you're doing it from an IA, IAC perspective, yeah, you would say use the latest version or whatever, but you shouldn't have to go into a container and say, you know, YUM update or whatever it is that you're using as your package manager. So I've made those changes. I can now run yum update to reflect those. It should trigger another alert to tell me, yeah, package management and process and container line. Think about this for a second. It's one thing on your host, you're going to do this all the time, is using package managers like yum to pull down these packages to start using these tools. But a container in runtime, like realistically, it should be the same design from deployment from that shift left as what should be running in shield right. You know, there shouldn't be massive changes. And notice how here, like I'm pulling all these dozens and dozens of images, I mean, hundreds of images, you're going to see lots of things like set UID, set git bit on these different objects that are pulled through, modifying binary directories, all of this happening. And I can see it in real time. I can see, okay, it's all happening inside the namespace overly permissive. It's all happening on the CentOS container. I could easily pick, paint a picture in my dashboard view to tell me, you know, from looking at the alerts, the kind of alerts, again, keep in mind, these are all just the generic syscalls by default we can easily see like weird stuff's happening and it's all happening in a specific pod or container. Like if you want to filter it for that context of search for that container name, you can, or even just search arbitrary things like crypto and then just see all the crypto specific activity with, and then look at it when it happened in a day, stuff like that. It's a very nice, simple UI to play around with. Um, so yeah, look at that. We updated our package manager. If I want to install, for instance, um, a Telnet, which we know is listed as one of those um, malicious tools or not malicious, but just a potentially ne strange networking tool. Then you can see like I launched package management process container. And this time if I write just telnet, it should trigger an alert telling me, I don't know if I, yeah. So it says launched suspicious networking tool in container. As we mentioned there, if you wanna check out how these rules work, all our rules are default rules are listed in GitHub. So you can just type in the rule name. You can see where it is. We mentioned earlier that there's this concept of macros and lists. So you can say network tool processes. I want to know what they are. We already know what the spawn process should be. But if I look up what the container tools are, you can then say, OK, um, yeah, it's listed. Look, see, it's a macro. And the macro says any of these are processes. So it has to be a process, but it's listed in this list. So if you want to see what the list is, you can then go. And you can see, yeah, it's things like Netcat, T Sharp, TCP Dump. So yeah, by that logic, why not install TCP Dump, right? So it's just as simple. After making the it changes to Yum, I can say Yum install TCP Dump. Did that? Is there an issue with that? Maybe. Um, oh yeah, I need to exit from here. Or sorry, get out. But if I run that other, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, if I Yum install TCP Dump, it's a relatively straightforward um, command. And just like that, if I do TCP dump, hit enter, it would start running TCP dump. But the important thing to note is if we went back into our UI, it would tell us, look, you ran um, a process from the um, that container. And yeah, it was the TCP dump process. You know, 
that, yeah, look, you can see process command line TCP dump was run. There was nothing more to it than that, but either way, it triggered the detection. So I'm conscious, yeah, we've only got a few minutes left. So I'm going to end the demo at that point. Um, apologies, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> so I'm just going to go back into the slide deck and just conclude with, um, but like I say, you can build plugins for all sorts of architectures, whether it be Kubernetes. Again, they already exist, but things like we created a GitHub plugin. So really powerful. I don't know if anyone wants to start asking questions at this point. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer. Great, thanks. I think they are uh, in the who and in the chat. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, oh, of course. Yeah, you can go through it, uh, or you want me to read to you? I yeah. So besides okay. system calls, what else? Falco trace from the kernel code perspective. Um, like I say, we have a an eBBF um implementation that we use so like there's the default in um or at least this default for now implementation but the ebbf probe actually can get additional context from the linux kernel which is again a huge um update um the best thing i could say is if you go to falco.org we actually list in detail um in our documentation section about how those different probes work and i think it's under a probes so category so again that'll give all the context about the different things we support other than just the default system call architecture. Um, and again, that's really important when we're talking about different plugins we're building going forward. Um, one of the questions there was like, is this working with AWS GCP and Azure? Uh, absolutely. Um, if I stop sharing my screen on the slide deck and go to, do you know the way I talked about these different GitHub repos? If I say AWS, uh, now I maybe I say CloudTrail, you see the way I can just go to CloudTrail and then there's already a plugin. So there's a CloudTrail plugin for AWS. And with that, there are dedicated rules, default rules that exist. And as you can see, they're tagged with, you know, Cloud, AWS, Console, IAM. So it's really easy. I think even if you type in like Okta, you know, yeah, we have like plugins for Okta and similarly, you can see the rules associated with it. So yeah, different plugins, uh, different cloud environments. The nice thing is that you'll have a single unified language for each of those different frameworks. Um, there was another question is if you have a question, oh yeah, sorry, no, it was, uh, did I miss anything further up? Sorry about questions. Um, or were they the only two at the end of the chat? My apologies, Bill. I think that's uh, two questions. Uh, another question is ask, uh, do we have a live demo in the session? I think this may already answered we. Oh, yeah. So we, we have the live demo that we just done there a while ago. However, uh, one thing I thought would be cool to share with everyone who is on the session who wants to test out the tool themselves is we actually wrote a blog. I didn't write this one personally, but it's an introduction to runtime security with Falco. Why I think this blog is really interesting is there's actually a link to some lab environments we've set up before. So like, again, if you don't, I mean, there's no reason, like a lot of people can just start running Falco in their own um, you know, on a Raspberry Pi or any IoT device, really, that supports Linux, it's good to go. Um, but if you don't have a device on hand, you can actually go into, I think it's Instruct Labs, and you can actually start playing with Falco using, you know, a dedicated tutorial of steps. And again, it's free to use. So, you know, from your browser, you can start playing with Falco. So I think that's a really cool resource for anyone who wants to do have more hands-on experience with Falco. But if there's any other questions while we have time, uh, I'm more than happy to answer. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, you can type in the chat and uh, or if you prefer to speak to ask questions uh, feel free to raise your hand and uh, you can uh, speak to ask questions or make comments yeah there's actually one question just came in there it's quite nice from uh darshan it was around future enhancements um yeah we're constantly evolving the product like if i went to balco.org and i guess that's under our blog section um you know we always document like every update that's coming through like monthly updates but one of the coolest updates, I guess, I mean, there's been a few good ones, but this one I find most interesting was Falco CTL. So you probably noticed that the whole way through my demonstration, I was using kubectl. 
to interact with my Kubernetes environment and naturally interact with Falco as well. Um, but things like updating rules, uh, making changes locally, and really just getting better use out of the tool. We have like this new Falco CTL, again, published recently. It was at the end of February. So if I just run Falco CTL, just give you an idea, um, it can be used in my environment for things like interacting with what we call artifacts. So things like repositories where, you know, we might be making changes to Falco rules and we don't want to, for instance, like I, I personally was doing a messy approach of making a YAML file with a list of all my different custom rules I'm creating. And then to force those changes, I was like deleting a workload or sorry, using Helm to like recreate my workloads to enforce the changes associated with that YAML file. It's a totally messy situation and would never really work in production. So Falco CTL is like a really nice streamlined tool that allows us to do things like interacting with registries, update, and you know, for interacting with plugins, recreating plugins, for interacting with uh, existing rules. So definitely, I'd put this in the chat as well, because if anyone's interested in like how we're updating the project, we're always trying to make it more user friendly. And I think Falco CTL was certainly the most interesting um, addition to the project. And as well, if you want to contact us about any other, you know, enhancements or feature requests that you have, yeah, feel free to. We're always embracing those. Great, thanks. Uh, we have uh, um, a couple of uh, minutes over time, but uh, again, if you have any last minute questions, uh, feel free to post in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak. Uh, actually, I turn. I turn off that uh, unmute. Uh, uh, you can, you know, unmute by yourself if you want. Thanks, Tasha, for the feedback. Um, I'm glad you like the sessions. All right. Uh, so if we don't have further questions, uh, that's uh, going to conclude our today's uh, webinars. Uh, thanks, uh, Nigel, for the great uh, presentation. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us for the uh, for the sessions. Um, we have another session is a uh, more deep dive on the uh, topic uh, is on the workshop. Uh, hands on. Actually, you can uh, Try it by yourself on uh, some of the code labs. Uh, it's going to be the next uh, week, uh, actually on March 30th, uh, same times here. Uh, yeah, if you are interested, want to learn more, uh, you can uh, register on the sign up for the event on the AI Camp website. And the session is recorded. Uh, you will send the notifications when the recording is available. Uh, you will get the notifications. Yeah, with that, I conclude today's events. Uh, again, thanks everyone. Thanks, uh, uh, you know, the speakers. Thanks uh, everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope to see you again in our next event. Uh, Najin, do you have any else you want to share? Like, uh, you know, any links or? Uh... No, it, it was just that last resource I put into the chat was around the runtime security. Okay. Uh, Definitely. And uh, as well, oh yeah, if anyone's interested, um, I can put as well as the OWASP Kubernetes top 10. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I find this quite useful for anyone who wants to read it is just the comprehensiveness of like um, all the things you need to factor into, not just runtime security, but uh, if oh, I put it to everyone there, sorry, uh, send it to everyone in meeting is just, it covers all the different aspects of, you know, infrastructure as code, shift left and shift right methodologies or shield right methodology. Um, and I just find it's a, an interesting read for those who are getting into cloud native security. <laughs>